So I have the privilege this morning of introducing our keynote speaker. Um, we are very fortunate to have Jan Geldmacher with us, and Jan is the uh, CEO of Vodafone Global Enterprise. Um, just really terrific that he can come and be with us. He was um, previously the CEO at BT Germany, and he has a real commitment to being here with us at the summit this year um, representing Vodafone because Vodafone understands how important it is to support the NGO base. And he's looking to drive innovation, innovative conversations with us um, about what's going on in the NGO sector and how Vodafone and um, technology can really support us. So very pleased to um, introduce Jan and um, thank him for being here with us this morning. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me this morning. It's really exciting to be here. Um, it's uh, actually the first time, I have to admit, that I speak in front of a crowd like you are, in front of uh, NGOs and organizations that do good around the world. Normally, I speak to people that try to earn much money. So um, it's exciting for me to share some of the ideas that we have with you guys this morning. I am excited to um, explain what Vodafone is all about, what Vodafone Global Enterprise is all about. And I hope I can challenge you a little bit, maybe inspire you a little bit, make you a bit, little bit um, uh, you know, looking into the things that I have to deal with every day because I believe strongly that what we do has impact on what you do. And if, but if we combine the forces in, a, in an appropriate way, I think we can do a lot more good things together. So let me start uh, with a brief um, introduction of what Vodafone Global Enterprise is all about because I think that needs some explanation. And I would really like to challenge you to interrupt me if you have questions or you know, ask questions when I'm done with the presentation. I think we have 45 minutes for this session, uh, so plenty of time to hopefully interact as well. Probably not in Danish for me, I have to admit that uh, was a little tricky. Actually, let's start with uh, what Vodafone Global Enterprise is all about. Vodafone Global Enterprise is an organization that exists in Vodafone since about nine years. So we will become 10 next year, actually. 10 years ago, nine years ago, we had the idea of actually creating an organization that is dedicated to deal with large multinational organizations and companies. And we only started with a few of them, with 56 when it started all. And then we have evolved over the years because the business concept was pretty successful. Basically, when you, uh, when you provide telecommunication services to large multinational organi organizations, they all struggle with finding the one place to deal with in order to create single service level agreements that can work around the world. And that was exactly why we were incorporated. So the purpose of Vodafone Global Enterprise is to deal with a dedicated number of customers, 1,700. And these customers are large multinational organizations, but it's also the international public sector and NGO organizations around the world. And all of these organizations have things in common. They work globally. So we have to serve them in more than 150 countries and territories around the world. And also they have something in common. They need telecommunication services in the same quality around the world wherever they offer services to their customers. So that's why we have been founded and that's how we operate around the world. So one global partner, one global PNL, one profit and loss um, statement, one service level agreement, and all of the services that Vodafone can offer throughout the world through that organization into our customers. I do that job since three years. I run that organization since three years. We have people in uh, more than 70 countries on the ground. We speak the languages of the countries we are serving in. We understand the culture of the countries we are dealing in, and therefore we are a local company, but with a global umbrella that enables us to serve global organizations worldwide. So it's pretty exciting to be in that space because actually these customers that we deal with, international public sector or commercial organizations, are the most challenging customers that you can deal with. So it's a lot of fun, but also a lot of challenges every day. Actually. I think we are living in a world of disruption and uh, you know the question is how do you thrive in a world of disruption and telecommunication from our perspective plays a big role in that and I would like to dwell a little bit on you know how we how we work internationally as a company and what kind of infrastructure we're using to serve our customers. Let me start first with 
the extended network of Vodafone companies around the world. We have 26 operating companies around the world uh, that are fully owned by Vodafone and some companies that are partly owned, joint ventures, and a lot of uh, partners that we strategically work together with. It's 55 partners that we work with. And when I talk about partners, normally in the telecommunication world, you hear about roaming partners where you roam traffic from one carrier to the other. In our case, it's different. When we talk about partners, we talk about strategic partnerships where the partners actually are acting like franchise partners so they can sell our services and we can sell their services in the respective uh, countries. And therefore, with that setup, we are really able to serve companies globally with that partner network. Obviously, behind that partner network, there's a lot of telecommunication infrastructure. And uh, with you know, the infrastructure in the fixed line business, we reach into more than 150 countries and territories around the world. And the purpose of that network is to connect the locations of our customers. That's um, one part of the strategy we are following. So an IP VPN, an IP virtual private network that connects the locations of our customers throughout the world in the same service level agreement that you are used from Europe in Africa or the same service level agreement that you have in Europe in Asia. So that's the purpose of that international network infrastructure. It's a network infrastructure that we have inherited through the acquisition of a company called Cable and Wireless four years ago and then integrated into Vodafone and expanded the footprint uh, uh, accordingly. So that's the, um, the very heavy infrastructure that we use to connect locations of our customers. On these networks sit the data centers. So why is that important? So when you run a network, you always want to give access you want to give your customers access to their applications. These, ex these applications are running in data centers. And actually, why is that important for customers? Because we are moving into a cloud world, and that cloud world means that we go away from CapEx-driven, heavy investment-driven business models into more flexible OPEX-driven business models. And that's what we do with our customers. We help them to thrive in that disruptive world by becoming more flexible, putting applications into data centers. And it makes sense to put it into data centers that sit on the network footprint because you have access to the data center through the network. And obviously that is changing pretty much the world of IT that we are, uh, that we are working in, uh, talking about cloud computing. I think we had that uh, during our breakfast and the lunch and the dinner last night. You know, this, this concept has been invented only 20 years ago, but it's happening today because we have the bandwidth in place and we have the processing power in place to really move into that space. But you know, Vodafone has been born mobile. You all know that Vodafone is a mobile company by heart. And obviously that's the third pillar of our infrastructure strategy, accessing, and f you know, accessing our customers through our mobile network. As of today, we serve 445 million customers around the world. And already 20 million of these customers are 4G enabled. So 4G is the fourth generation of mobile network, which gives you a very, very high bandwidth and a low latency. So our customers are, uh, are, dr are driving us very much in rolling out that 4G network infrastructure around the world because it really matters. Why would that matter, for example, for NGOs and uh, agencies? Obviously because 4G enables us to serve applications, to supervise, to monitor elderly people, to help trans offer translation services to people, for example, in refugee camps, or to uh, develop new applications that need high bandwidth. So 4G, from my perspective, from our perspective, is not necessarily something that is only important for the United States of America and for Europe. It's important for all, uh, all over the world. And we roll out 4G networks wherever we can apply for uh, the frequency, the spectrum, and the license to do so. So the limitation lies in providing us with the spectrum through the regulatory bodies around the world. Wherever we can access these spectrum uh, free and frequencies, we roll out our network. So as we speak, we roll out the 4G infrastructure. I'm very proud to also announce, uh, uh, actually I've announced it two weeks ago already, but it's pretty fresh, that we have started a mobile service in the US. So you see on that slice, uh, slide uh, launching fall, 
2015. So we launched a mobile service in the US uh, only on uh, uh, October 21st. It's um, very exciting for us because it is the first and only mobile service in the US that is launched specifically for enterprise customers, for global enterprise customers. And with that launch now, I'm in the, in the situation to offer worldwide roaming tariffs that take away the risk of, um, of cost expl explosion when you travel with your mobile phone at the in, the in the hands. Because we found out that data roaming and voice roaming is one of the biggest hurdles to really make use of the mobile, sto mobile phones in a productive way. So that enables us now to offer these kinds of, you know, not roaming free, but controlled roaming cost tariffs around the world, which really is an innovation in itself. So we're very happy to be able to offer these kinds of services to our customers exclusively um, in the world. Um, in the telecommunication world, um, in infrastructure investment is one of the most important things. Differentiation happens through the quality in the network. Differentiation happens through coverage. So investing into infrastructure is one of the core things we do. Rolling out networks in a very fast way is something that we know very well to do. It's only um, two years, three years ago that we sold our shares in Verizon Wireless uh, in the US and we um, achieved a fantastic price for the assets of 130 billion US dollar, 130 billion US dollar. Actually, um, Vodafone uh, gave back uh, um, most of that money through an extra dividend to the shareholders but it still left us with a huge investment opportunity into infrastructure. So we invested and we kicked off what we call Project Spring, the single largest infrastructure investment program that has been ever done in the telecommunication industry. And we have decided to spend about 19 billion pounds, which is a little bit more than 30 billion US dollar in two years, investing into infrastructure, growing our 4G coverage, growing our network by adding new points of presence to our fixed network infrastructure and by expanding our network into the Middle East and Africa because we clearly believe that this is where the business happens, not just in your, uh, in your, your environment, also in the commercial environment. We see customers investing heavily in Asia. We see customers heavily investing in Africa and therefore a network presence in these countries, uh, in the countries of Africa is of utmost importance to, to fuse the expansion of our customers and to help them, to enable them to do what they need to do. And I'll give you just one example. Um, you have a very scattered landscape of carriers in, in Africa with all these countries, with different regulatory environments, with different infrastructure that you have in place. And a customer like DHL, for example, they came to us and said, we, we want to connect all of our 600,000 square meters of warehouse space around the country onto one network and not to on a scattered landscape of networks. And with our infrastructure, we can do something like that. So we provide DHL with connecting all their company, their locations through one, through one network, and therefore we can provide them with one service level agreement so that they can offer to their customer the same service they offer to them in Europe or in other parts of the world. So this is just an example of how we expand our footprint. We have now about 75% through of that investment, so we are coming to an end of the extra investment. And just take into account, this is on top of the regular investment we do anyway um, uh, on an every year basis to, uh, to maintain and to upgrade our networks around the world. So network infrastructure in terms of quality and in terms of footprint is of utmost importance to what Vodafone and Vodafone Global Enterprise does with their customers. Again, you can uh, interrupt me when you have questions, when I talk a language that you don't understand. Um, I'm not too familiar with the language that you speak, and so probably I ought also ask questions to you then if I don't understand, so please feel free. Um, I would like to uh, dwell a little bit also on how we work with um, the uh, agencies and the NGOs, because I think it's important to acknowledge that we have two different ways of, of doing that. One way is through our Vodafone Foundation. And our Vodafone Foundation supports organizations and uh, institutions that are charitable. And we 
do good through Vodafone Foundation. And we support um, activities uh, to develop, um, develop communications um, technology into helping fight poverty, helping uh, providing education, helping providing health care, or helping against domestic violence, or helping in disaster recovery environments. Um, I, I think that's a typical thing that a foundation does. But we also have, in parallel to that, Vodafone Global Enterprise, which is focusing more on commercial viable solutions for customers. And customers are, as I said at the beginning, commercial customers, but also international um, non-governmental organization and agencies like yours, that like yours. World Health Organization, Save the Children. This is what we work with, that is who we work with through a commercial approach. And I think this is important to mention because um, you know, working in that environment does not work only if you do charitable work. You only ne also need to do something that creates sustainability through getting into a money earning pattern because only if you earn money you can reinvest it into charitable organization. And that's the principle we try to follow. We try to team up with the foundation and combine the doing good through telecommunication services with the, uh, with the approach of doing commercial viol viable applications in the market. And um, yeah, we have a couple of examples and I'm happy to share them. And my colleagues that are in the room are happy to share them after the session as well on how we do that and with whom we do that. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we can be, uh, we, we are proud, we're taking a big pride in actually what we have achieved in that sector over the last couple of years. And there's, um, there's one testimony uh, I'm, I'm proud to pull onto a screen here. Uh, and that is the, um, the Fortune uh, Changed the World list 2015 and Vodafone was voted number one on that list. And, you know, this is very, very important for us because it's not only helping us to to actually market our service to uh, organizations like you. It's also working internally because it makes our people very proud in what they do. And with that, we motivate them very much to do even more. So that's very important for us. And we have, we have achieved this uh, number one listi listing through a couple of uh, things that we did with our customers. And I only want to mention a few of them. Um, one is um, a um, implementation of a very successful money transfer service. And you all have heard about M-Pesa. And you all know what M-Pesa does in Africa, probably. 800 million US dollar transaction volume in, Ka in, uh, in Kenya uh, alone. But did you know that we also have launched M-Pesa into India? And if you, uh, if you think about it, India in the last 100 years has built up a banking sector and has uh, created only about 100,000 points of presence, banking points of presence in India altogether in 100 years. In less than one year, we have launched M-Pesa to 90,000 uh, points of presence up to now. It doesn't, it doesn't take us very long. It takes us a week or so to create a, uh, a, an agency that is an M-Pesa point it's a little bit of training, it's a little bit of due diligence, it's a little bit of setting up infrastructure, and then it works. In just one year, we have achieved what the banking sector has achieved in more than 100 years in a continent, in a country like India. So that's an exciting example of what we can do if we combine you know, the doing good work with a, with a commercial approach. Another example is um, our work with the Gavi Alliance uh, where we help um, about 73 countries that are amongst the most poor countries to provide healthcare services and healthcare infrastructure to their people um, to obtain um, new ideas and, uh, and use uh, you know, new ways of, uh, of authentifying vaccinations, for example. So that's another example I think that is very successful. And again, it's a combination of doing good and a commercial viable uh, model that stands behind it. And um, also, I think to mention, because it's an, it's, an, uh, it's an actual very, very high importance, it's instant classrooms, where we have provided refugee camps with instant classroom environments where we can educate people, children, uh, uh, you know, amongst the refugees in the refugees camps where uh, normally there's no access to education. 
And only in a couple of uh, months we have educated and we have reached 15,000 children in refugees camps already. And we intend to extend that to 3 million refugee children uh, until 2020. So there's lots of good examples of what we do in the, in the work together between foundation and our commercial approach around the world. And I would like to um, give you one more example of uh, how we work with farmers. And this is truly how we use Niki technology in a disruptive but Meba positive way. Ni kwa vizuri umeoshi, umekausha, nimefuata processi zote. Ni kwamba bei ni kwa na kuenda kuikuta pale kwenye sehemu kwenye kituo kile wanacho nunulia kukoa. Kwa hiyo sasa hile ilikuwa inashindika na mikuweza kupanga marengo. Sasa hivi na kuwa na uhakika kwa sababu siitaji kuenda kumuuliza ofisa wangu pale na tumia simu yangu. Nikiingia kwenye simu yangu na pata bei ilioko leo ilioko kwenye soko la dunia kwa hiyo nanufaika zaidi kwa sasa hivi kuliko pale zamani maana zamani iku inabidi mkusanyike sasa kama haupo elimu imekufika lakini sasa hivi hata kama ni mkutano tu wa wanachama kila mmoja anapelekewa message yake kwenye simu wapo nyuma tuko nalipwa kwa kushika karatasi na ilitwa list alafu baadaye ndipo ta kwenda kuionyesha nani hiyo karatasi kwamba tayari hela ilishaingia ndio naanza wanaangalia kwenye kumbukumbu kumbu zao nao kwa ndipo analikuwa na kwa hela lakini sasa hivi unakwenda moja kwa moja unapewa hela taslimu pale pale kabla ya karatasi kama ukitaka listi ndio lakini sasa namshukuru Mungu kwamba ameshatufungulia kwamba inakipitia kwenye MPS ninavyoona kama alivyosema tukipo sasa umekuwepo naona vitu vingi vitabadilika mm. kwa mfano kokoa zetu tukizioka pale wa, yani kila majibu tuta, na mimi mwenyewe nitakuwa naona hata majibu kwenye simu yangu kwa sababu nitakuwa tayari simu yangu na mimi nafanya kazi mm. na hiyo biashara nitaielewa inaendeje ni faida kubwa sana tupinda amcos ni ni chama ambacho kianzisha na wakulima wa kujiunga kwa pamoja baadaye ndipo kama kujenga ilijengwa kwa inashughulika na nuzo ya mazao mfano mpunga kokoa kipinja nyuma kokoa wakati zipo kweli kwa siku cha zaidi ya shilingi milioni kumi, tulikuwa na kanazo hapa kwa uwezo wa kununua tani 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 mbili moja na nusu tulikuwa tuna uwezo kwa kampuni kwenye tunaona kama inasaidia sana kwa sababu hawana ile kashikashi ya kuja kuja na mapikipiki yao kutuletea hela kwenye vituo sasa ni swala ambalo nakuingizia tu kwa kutumia simu ningia kwenye simu naona message hiyo imekupia kiasi kadhaa na ni kwa mtazamo wangu naona huu mfumo utasaidia sana kwa sababu namrahishia mtu kutokukaa na mahela mkononi naona itasaidia sana kwa mzee wangu anavuuza kokoa akishazi vundika vizuri tukichuma na vundika na ziosha ndo na nalimpigia simu mimi kwamba nimpeleke kwa sababu hapa ume aliyokuwa nao kidogo aweze kabeba mzigo lazima mm. nitafute hewani mimi afu mimi ndo nipeleke mzigo pale olao pale anayelipo ni mzee wangu hapo bana ilipo kwa sababu ile swala baada ya kumweleza ile swala iliyotokeza ile kwamba swala ya MPS ila japo wewe tukawa ni muda mrefu nikawa nimemweleza jinsi ilivyokuwa kwamba MPS ipo hivi na hivi na hivi kesa ambacho hata mimi kinituma siwezi nikafanya nini nikakuibia hapo yote yani unaona kwa sababu mimi nitakavoleta kule kilo kila mezisoma yule boss ambaye yupo pale amezisoma kilo yeye ndo atakurushia hela for Olam it is crucial to be able to connect to the farmers on a regular basis to inform them on good agriculture practices to inform them on price changes and also on the location or the date of opening of our buying centers and uh, mobile technology such as Wadacom and Mpesa is definitely solving many of these issues. So I think this is a fantastic example of how a simple technology like text message can really disrupt a whole process. It's the whole it's a complete supply chain and money transfer process in that environment that has been disrupted in a very positive way by applying simple technology to a problem, to solve a problem. And I think for, for me the, uh, the best quote in that uh, short video was uh, you know, the farmer that said, I feel empowered 
because I have all the information and the money in my hand, in, my, in the palm of my hand, using my mobile phone. And it's not even a smartphone. It's a, it's a very old-fashioned feature phone, so very, very cheap infrastructure that we apply here to solve that very complex problem. So actually, a good example of how, um, how disruption can be used in a positive way to solve problems in our today's world economy. But actually, what is it that is changing our world so fast and so much in these days? And this is a question that we ask our customers every now and then through customer advisory boards. So we very much interact with our customers and try to find out what is moving them, what is, what is happening next from their perspective, where are they investing next, what is the actually the problem they're trying to solve next. And it not necessarily must be connected to telecommunication and IT service in the first moment. But over the time, it becomes clear that telecommunication IT can be a solving factor for dealing with these changes around the world. And I think it is very obvious that over the last couple of years, we see that the economic power in our world economy is, is switching or is traveling around the world. And in the past, Europe was very dominant. The United States were very dominant. But in the last couple of years, you know, the, through the rise of China, we saw a complete change in the way you know, financing is done around the world. And when, you, if, when, you, when we questioned and when we asked our customers, where do you invest next? All of them said, well, we go to China. We invest in China. We invest in, uh, invest in Asia. But when you talk then to Chinese headquartered customers and ask them, where do you invest next? They say, well, we invest in Africa. And then all of a sudden, the disruption happens again. And all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia is the biggest investor in Africa. And China is falling behind. So there's a constant change in the economic power shifting around the world. Uh, Europe and the United States lose, um, lose maybe a little bit against, uh, against China and, and the uh, Middle East world, but maybe that will change again. Companies, organizations, agencies have to react to that. You have to deal with that every day. That is happening as we speak, and it's having, have it happening at an ever faster pace. The second uh, big, big influencer of change is the age of autonomy. That's how we call it now. You could also say it's the Internet of Things. You could also say, to make it very easy, it's machine-to-machine -machine communication. But what is happening here? We, have, we see a, a trend that is accelerating very, very fast. We see that not only people and locations can be connected through the Internet, also assets can be connected to the Internet. Machines will be connected. So we put SIM cards into machines. We put SIM cards into assets. And the automotive industry is a fantastic example for that. Um, just take uh, Jaguar Land Rover or Volkswagen or BMW or Ford uh, or Tesla, whoever you, you, you want in that industry. We connect their cars by putting our SIM card into the car. And by putting a SIM card into the car, we do not only provide you know, services to the end user that is sitting in the car and you maybe is consuming a navigation system or so or traffic information. We also do predictive maintenance. We also do tracking. We track the assets. We know where they are. And again, think about what that means for your environment. Think about how do you secure assets in your environment when you roll out infrastructure into countries where it's maybe dangerous to leave it on the street, but you have to leave it on the street. You want to use it and you want to make use of it, but therefore you need to control it. You need to track it. You need to uh, bring it back if it's stolen. So this is the Internet of Things. This is the age of autonomy, autonomy you know, making things autonomous uh, when, they, when they are deployed into the field, into the market. That's happening every day. So we have today, as Vodafone, 23 million machines connected already. But to give you, an, uh, give you an impression of what that acceleration will look like, we assume that it will be 50 billion machines connected by 2020. So it's an acceleration curve that will hit us and it will change the way we do business around the world. And the third big changing factor is the uh, rise of the digital native. Or you could say it's the um, demographics that we see in our world happening. And if I just reflect again <coughs> onto the corporate world, as of today in multinational organizations, we see four generations of people working in one company. Four generations, including the digital natives. Just think about the spread. And now if you move forward by 2020 again, we assume it will be five generations. 
retirement, the retirement age will increase, hitting the work workplace age will decrease. So you will have five generations working in one organization environment. What does that mean for telecommunication and IT? How do you deal with that when you are the CIO of an international organization that does not even have an office anymore but is working virtually? How do you apply telecommunication tools to make it most efficient? But also how do you reflect using the technology to deal with the democratic, demo, democratic demographics um, in around the world? Think about elderly people. How do we take care of elderly people? How will that impact our uh, economy? How will, we, how will we secure an environment where we have to take care of more elderly people than younger people grow up after that? And apply that throughout the world and you see what kind of challenge we are facing in that environment. And we believe we can deal with all of these challenges by applying telecommunication and IT solutions in the right way. And we think we need to take three things into account basically, and that's agility, that's proactive, proactivity, and that's innovation. And probably innovation is the most important one, but without agility and proactivity, it doesn't work. And I would like to um, dwell on these, um, uh, this slide a little bit also. Um, agility, for example, is starting by connecting the locations of your organization, be it in the field, be it in the capitals, be it in the, in the countries where the money comes from, the spender, spender money comes from, is providing connectivity on a secure way to really communicate and be, be ready to communicate in an agile way around the world. So wide area networks on infrastructure like the one that I have shown earlier in more than 150 countries helps to create this agility. But it's also obviously to be cost effective in communication. And again, wide area networks support in doing that by applying the right application on top of that. So the infrastructure enables us to be agile. But also it's uh, providing um, stuff like, um, you know, pop-up stops, pop-up shops when it becomes necessary. Providing, as I talked about, education on the fly when refugees camps are built. It's providing healthcare applications through pop-up infrastructure that needs to be connected immediately. And it's also imp important, I think, uh, to create environments that are not meant to last for years, but maybe only for months. For example, when a, when a disaster um, uh, hits the world, um, like, for example, when um, uh, in the Philippines two years ago, uh, the big hurricane hit the country. And we, we did build up an instant network environment and we provided uh, telecommunication services to the people that were suffering from that, from that uh, uh, typhoon. And uh, in, two, in 10 days, actually people on our network made 250,000 calls. And that infrastructure was built up in 48 hours. So be agile by using telecommunication infrastructure. I think that's a very good recipe. But also be proactive. Um, again, talking about uh, uh, farming, crop farming. How do we actually deal with the big data that we have at our hands? We know where the weather is today and where it will go. And we can observe and can maintain and can, can follow the weather developments around a country and help farmers to prepare for the weather when it hits um, their crop fields. But also we can track, for example, through our technolo technology, how a disease is expanding across a, a region by tracking the people. And we see, you know, through the mobile, pho mobile phones how people are, are moving around the country and we can follow them and track and therefore detect patterns and see how we deal with that in a proactive way. But I think the most important thing is innovation. And innovation enables us to, um, to actually deal with, um, with disruption in a positive way, to react in a positive way. And the secret always is how do you actually make innovation happen? And I think it is important to really combine here the knowledge of companies. So combine, combine the knowledge that, for example, we have as Vodafone, but also companies like Microsoft or Cisco or other IT and telecommunication companies with the knowledge that you have in your hands. Co-creation is the secret to solve things. And I have a, sorry, excuse me, a couple of examples um, how innovation can really positively disrupt the world. And I think uh, M-Pesa is a good one. But also I would like to share with you um, one example. Um, um, 
on how, how we can co-create. And that example comes from the, uh, from the insurance industry, not necessarily from an NGO environment, but I think it can be applied everywhere. I, 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 I try to explain you the, the issue and then explain you how we solved it and how we tackled it. So it's a very simple thing. If you buy a car in the UK, um, you are insured on that car. You insure yourself. So I buy a car, I'm insured on that car. If my wife wants to drive that car, she's not insured. If um, a friend of mine wants to borrow my car and drive that car in London, he's not insured. So with that in mind, every year in the UK, we have about four to five million journeys that are uninsured. So you could say, well, that's a big risk for the society because if something happens, nobody can pay. But it's also a big miss for the insurance industry because they lost an opportunity to insure these, these, these journeys. So that issue was introduced to us. So we sat together with the insurance company. We built a co-creation and innovation team, pulling together forces, ring-fenced it, gave them a little bit of fund. It was not, not, not a lot, 250,000 pounds altogether. And we then told them, you know, you go ahead and solve that problem with the, is with the assets that you have in your hands. And actually, the team came up with a very innovative uh, idea. By digging deep into the data, they found out that there's a correlation between the use of mobile data and driving patterns. So w you wouldn't believe that if you, if you tell that without any evidence, but it's, it's really true. So the use of mobile data and risk of driving, there's a correlation. So the team came up with an application that combines the user data and the risk of the car that was exposed by, you know, by providing that into, a, into an application that gives you an ad hoc on the fly insurance service. Very risk averse because actually the, risk, the assurance company could detect the risk of the driver. So a big problem solved with a very, very small amount of money by putting together brains from two companies. And my message is combine the knowledge, combine the know-how of companies, combine it and don't do innovation in isolation. Bring it together, make it happen, and then it will evolve. Innovation is the key to deal with disruption in the industry um, that we are facing all together. Vodafone is uh, really proud to um, also support the UN uh, global goals, the sustainability development goals. And we believe that um, there is an opportunity in supporting these goals. It's an opportunity for Vodafone to deal with it for ourselves because we believe it's good for us to be part of that, that global framework. But I think we can also contribute to solve um, issues around the world. And there are a couple of examples. Again, goal number three, uh, good health and well-being. Well, I mentioned the Gavi Foundation uh, with the vaccination program in 30, uh, 73 countries. Or goal number four, quality and education. Uh, the instant classroom, three million um, educated children in refugee camps until 2020 is the target that we aim for. Or, you know, it's, I think, the uh, goal number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. I talked about Project Spring, our investment into infrastructure. That is key to develop innovation around the world. But I think the most important one for us and for me here on stage is uh, number 17, the partnering, the partnering, the approach to work with guys like you here in the room and to help innovate the world and help create something that is a positive disruption uh, for our markets that we deal in for the stuff that we have to deal with. So my final question is, um, are you ready to do that? I hope um, I could inspire you a little bit of working with Vodafone and uh, making you understand what the assets is, are that we bring to the table. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think we would have five minutes left if you have questions. bit of a nerdy techie question for you. Uh, it said that for, for, for true autonomy, machine autonomy, machine to mean internet of things, internet of me, 5G is a necessity, 4G isn't sufficient. Where is Vodafone on 5G? Good question, actually. Um, not a nerdy question. It's really, uh, it's, uh, 
there's a, 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 it's a huge background behind that question. It's absolutely true. To create really autonomous driving, for example, you need very, very low latency and uh, very high bandwidth, and the actually the network needs to be very close to the actual user, which is the machine in this case, and it needs 100% reliability. So network reliabilities as we have them today with 99.999 is not sufficient for autonomous driving, for example, because you really risk people's life into the hands of a machine. So 5G is the is a way to uh, find a solution here. 5G is the fifth generation of uh, mobile phones, which uh, of mobile transmission, which has, um, I think, low latency as a key differentiator. We, uh, we put a lot of money into R&D in order to, um, to be amongst the first that will launch it. Again, it will be subject to um, spectrum auctions in the respective countries. Uh, we have invested into two universities, uh, one in the UK and one in Germany, working together on, on coming up with the technology that is needed. We have actually launched uh, 5G in, in labs already to test it. Uh, we assume it will hit the market in 2020, uh, and then the, um, the acceleration will re really happen. Until then, we will have, you know, sort of autonomy in, in, in how we connect uh, machines. For example, talking about cars, you have autonomous driving already today. Uh, the Tesla is doing that, uh, but you are supposed, and that is again uh, an insurance uh, and, and liability issue, to touch the steering wheel every 15 minutes to tell the car you're still there, uh, you know, because you cannot fully trust the machine yet because of latency issues, because of network availability issues, because of technology availability issues that you might have. So it's coming. It's uh, 2020 that it we that we predicted will hit the market and it will change the world dramatically again. Better to be prepared. Yeah, and if I can just, just take you back to Project Spring and, and 4G uh, and the investment. Um, are we right to assume that that kind of, I think you said 19 or 30, 30 plus billion dollars, mm -hmm that that will be deployed over the next two or three years? Is that the sort of horizon? Filling in those white spaces on that graph, on that map. Yeah, it well, it is, um, it is deployed already 75%. So we, we started um, two years ago. We are close to be finished. The intention is to finish our rollout program by the end of our fiscal year, which ends on the 31st of uh, March. Um, I, I, you know, it's, uh, we, are, we are way through the program already. So we are rolling out about I think it is 18,000 uh, 4G network uh, points of presence every month these days. So it's a huge, a huge logistics exercise. And it's, um, it's filling some white spots. It's, uh, you know, it's creating um, um, 4G coverage um, in, in, you know, in rural areas. It's, it's really deploying the network everywhere. On the, on the fixed line, um, we intend to, um, to grow the, um, the coverage uh, to from about now 230 points of presence that we have. You saw on that map maybe, if you remember it, the points on the, on the global map, we grow that to 320 points of presence. Uh, just to give you an example, in the US we had nine points of presence, we now have 30 points of presence. So we really have a country covering network infrastructure in place. Same is true for Africa, same is true for Asia. So, um, so our, our intent is really to, to, to deploy the infrastructure to serve our customers. So very much of what we deploy is customer driven. Um, so the money is there, the funding is there, uh, the business cases are there, we are in the middle of executing it. And um, actually, as I said, 75% is true. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your plans about mobile networks in Africa, Asia, Latin America? You are doing very well in the Northern Hemisphere, but in the South it looks not as good yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it's, um, again, it's uh, for a company that needs to make some money um, to reinvest into network infrastructure, uh, we need to look into business cases, obviously. We have uh, uh, network infrastructure in Africa and South Africa, in North of South Africa countries, we have invested into Egypt. We have to invested into Qatar. Uh, we are in Ghana. Um, we, uh, you know, we have uh, a couple of networks. We are in Kenya, as you know, uh, with our network infrastructure and our joint ventures. Um, and we are in couple of in a couple of more countries. Buying more assets is a question of a business case. Um, 
you know, the market availability of companies is not as it as, as we would wish for. But we are looking for uh, for uh, you know for mergers and acquisitions opportunity. Uh, you know, we're probably looking into everything, but you know, we are not making um, unreasonable business decisions. So. We invest into the countries where we are already. So we invest heavily into South Africa. We invest heavily in Ghana. And if you, if you, for example, drive through uh, through the countryside in Ghana, also through the rural areas, you will have a, a 3G coverage like you would have it in the UK. So um, I, I was personally impressed when I was recently there. Uh, you know how mobile phones are used in Ghana, not like in London where you download uh, music clips and videos. There, it's really used for education and for, uh, for services that are necessary for the people, so therefore the infrastructure investment for us is very important. So we invest in the countries that we have assets in. We're looking into opportunities all the time, uh, but only um, do acquisitions if it's a, you know, a reasonable business case. Jan, thank you for your talk, very much appreciated. If I could ask a non-technical question um, on agility. How did you get your organization to, what were the top things that you had to overcome in order to instill a cultural change for agility in your organization? Well, I think it's really interacting with customers and understanding what their needs are and uh, being close to customers, having the customer in mind with everything you do. And I know it's easy to say, it's hard to make that happen. But we preach that, we train that, we talk to customers, we try to understand um, their, their needs, their future needs. And, uh, and also I, I, I think it's, um, it's important to, um, you know, to, 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 to create a strategic closeness to your customer in order to really create the agile, agile organization to deal with it. Uh, in the minute when our people understand what it means for customers, they're happy to invest time and extra time and extra hours and, and make things happen. So it's, I think it's, it's not so much a you know, standard recipe of how to implement a culture. It's a, standard, it's, a, it's a standard thing from my point of view, which is being close to customers and having customers in your mind. And I think the same is true for you guys. If you, if you think about you know, those people that actually spent the money or that donate the money, um, then you probably are not agile. If you think about the refugees in the camps and their destiny, then you become agile, because that is what driving what's driving us. That's what's driving the people. That's what's driving the people in our organization, actually. Thank you so much, Jan. This was great. Uh, let's give it a round of, a round of applause. Thank you so much.